Okay, um, we're going to start to talk about 6.2 now, the other part of chapter 6. And um, it deals with the binomial distribution, which is um, one of the most important discrete distributions that we have. Um, and it comes up a lot in many real world situations. So um, before I get into this slide, um, talking about the binomial probability um, itself, let me talk about a simpler probability, um, which is called a Bernoulli trial. And uh, Dr. Love doesn't have a slide for this, so I made my own. And uh, the Bernoulli trial is one of the early ideas of um, the 17th century. And it was invented by a guy named Jacob Bernoulli, or discovered by a guy named Jacob Bernoulli. And uh, he was one of the Bernoulli brothers. And they're kind of famous, um, their whole family. Um, and they were very active scientists. And they really came up with some of the basic ideas of probability. Um, and um, coming from a very famous family, um, they did a lot of kind of interesting things. Um, and the most important one he did, I think, besides what we're talking about now, is uh, he invented or discovered the idea of E um, and found the value of what it is and how to approximate it and stuff. So anyway, in the late uh, 1600s, uh, the Bernoulli brothers were doing their thing. And one of the things that they did a lot of, um, which is discussed later in the Wikipedia article, is that they gambled a lot. And in fact, there's a story, which I don't know if it's true, it's not on the Wikipedia page, so it must not be. But the story was that they gambled so much in France um, that they figured out really patterns of things. So um, if you ever hear about people making side bets, um, so if you're playing a dice game and you know, um, maybe you figured out you know, that a seven comes up uh, one sixth of the time, but um, they didn't have all the exact probabilities figured out, especially for more complicated things. So things like, um, well, you could have a side bet where, um, you know, a seven, uh, the hard way, which is a six and a one, um, would give you a different payout than some other seven. And because they were really clever, they worked out things um, much more accurately than other people had. And so they were sort of famous that um, while other people were saying, oh, it's about a third, they knew that it was really more like 37% or whatever. And what that meant was in an individual bet, it probably didn't matter that much. But if you were gambling over the course of a night, having that little bit more piece of information would help you uh, win a little bit more money. Anyway, one of the stories is, is that the French court kicked them out of the whole country of France. And I don't know if that part's true. And again, it's not on the Wikipedia page. But if you think of late 1600s France, which you know eventually led up to the French Revolution and all that, the idea that these uh, guys were uh, so clever, they got themselves kicked out of France is sort of a fun um, little story. Anyway, um, what they decided was you could model pretty much all gambling events as an individual trial. And so the Bernoulli trial is the idea that we're just thinking that everything has two possibilities. Either the thing happens or it doesn't happen. And uh, from that, we can make just these really simple um, discrete random distributions. So if we just think of the probability of a success is a P, and the probability of a failure is not that. So it's one minus P because probabilities we know have to add up to one. Um, it's a lowercase P, which is kind of annoying considering we use capital P for the broader idea of probability. And then lowercase P is the probability of a success in an individual case. Now, if we were to do the math to it that we did last time, um, it's actually kind of boring. And even though it has a letter in it, so it's algebra instead of arithmetic, Right, the idea that a zero happens one minus p of the time and a one happens p percent of the time. Right, multiply that through that when you multiply by zero, you get a zero, you multiply one times p, you get p, you add them up, the average is p. And what they really discovered that made really um, probability possible in the fancier forms that we're setting it now is they realized that you can pretty much model anything as a binary event. So even if you're imagining, oh, well, what's the thrust of the rocket? And that has six decimal places and we got to get it accurate to whatever to do what we need. Another way to think about it is, well, either you succeeded in sending the rocket to space or you didn't. And you could model the probability that way. And what got it even more powerful was this idea of the binomial where you could say, we could think of lots of things as a sequence of these identical events. So, a binomial distribution has the conditions that we have a fixed number of these Bernoulli trials. Each one has two outcomes, a success or a failure. The probability of success, that P, stays the same throughout. 
Now, often that might not be true, but if it's close enough to true that we can make the assumption, we can still model it as a binomial. And then the last one is the idea that the trials are independent. So if we think about something like rolling two dice a bunch of times, that meets all of these conditions, right? The probability of rolling a seven doesn't change over the course of rolling. Um, the dice don't talk to each other, so they're independent across all the trials. There's some value that you win and some values that you lose. <laughs> and our random variable is just going to be the number of successes that we find. And notationally, we're going to use this number of trials, the probability of success, and then just count how many successes we have. And that's what we're going to be doing as we model things as a binomial. So, for example, if we toss a coin 10 times and we just count how many heads or tails we have, that's a binomial experiment. If the five basketball players each attempt a free throw, is that a binomial experiment? Or if the 10 cards are in the box and we draw three out, is that a binomial experiment? Well, the first one is a binomial experiment because it meets all the conditions. The second one, presumably the basketball players um, have different probabilities of success. So that's a certain age. Remember Shaquille O'Neal famously missing three throws all the time, even though he's a great basketball player in all the other ways. Of course, you know him because all he does now is commercials and uh, hosting uh, um, televised basketball. But the idea that their probability is all different. Now, if we assume they all had the same probability, we could build a model, but it might not be very accurate if there were big differences. The third one is also not a binomial experiment because if we pull the cards out of the box, the, what's left in the box changes. So we call that drawing without replacement, meaning that you keep the cards and you don't put them back. Um, a lot of card games work that way so that over the course of a game, um, you know, the cards you have in your hand aren't still in the deck. Now, in some games, the cards you have in a deck are known to you, but the cards I have in my hand, you don't know. So in that case, you don't know where they are. So you might as well, you can assume that uh, the cards could be in the deck because you don't know. And that's how a binomial distribution works. So um, we could then uh, start to think about how we would calculate um, one of these things. And if you actually break it up, um, you can draw the little chart about all the different ways it can happen. And you can start multiplying all of those value together. We can multiply them because they're independent. So listing all the ways, even for the simple case where we're just looking at three uh, free throws with 81% chance, man, is that annoying to do. So what we'd like to find is a simplifying formula for that. And even though the formula is, again, not simple to do, especially by hand, it's actually composed of three components that are uh, relatively um, easy to understand. So um, the probability of a certain number of successes is going to be this combination thing that we did last chapter, n choose x times the probability of x times 1 minus p to the n minus x. Now, if we split that up into three uh, formats, I think it makes actually a lot more sense. So if we start here um, with the p to the x, so wait a minute. There we go. Um, if we start here with our uh, p to the x, um, the idea there is that you're making x successes in a row. And we know that somehow, if you're going to make you know, one of your three free throws, you need to make a free throw for one of those. So having a p to the x in the formula, I think, makes a certain amount of sense. Um, then over here, we have one minus p to the n minus x. Ooh, that looks, there we go. Uh, one minus p to the n minus x. And the idea there is that, um, uh, one minus p to the n minus x. The idea is if you make x of your free throws, you're going to miss all the rest of them. So you make one free throw and you miss two. So you miss two is going to be one minus p, 81% chance you make a free throw, 18% you don't, 19% you don't. So 19 to the second power is going to be that. So that takes care of these two numbers. The third number right here in the beginning is um, the combination. And the idea there is that the order 
that you make your free throws or not doesn't matter. So if we look back at this example, and I know Isaac passed it pretty quick before, we can see that the number of ways that you make a free throw, if you make one of them, well, you either do you make it success, fail, 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 success, fail, or fail, fail, success. So all three of those had the same number and it happened three times. So three choose one happens three times. That's an easy one of those combinational numbers. And again, the idea that we had one of the successes, whether it was in the first one, the second one, or the third one, and then two of the failures. And again, whether that was one and three or somewhere else in the calculations, okay? So again, this formula, sort of annoying, but it works. If we do a little bit more algebra, and the book explains how we calculate this, we get that the number of successes is expected to be NP. So the mean of the random variable is the probability of success times the number. Now, even though that formula sort of comes out of nowhere, it's fairly intuitive. If I said, um, you know, the coin flip comes up heads 50% of the time, and we're going to flip a coin 100 times, how many times would you expect it to come out of head, uh, heads? Well, 50 makes sense. Or if I said we're going to roll dice 100 times and it comes out 16 and two thirds percent, well, 16 and two thirds is going to be the average. The variance is a little more complicated, but again, you could work that out algebraically. So now we can look at this free throw example that we had before. Again, the idea that the free th throw shooter makes 81%. Now they're going to do 12 free throws, so we're not going to work it out. And we can carry out this mathematics. Now again, uh, you know, 12 choose 11 or 12 choose 12 is uh, the combination number. That's a different notation she uses, um, but um, we could work that math out. Then take 0.81 to the first power times 0.81 to the 11, 12 minus 11th power, and you get the answer. And you can find the mean and standard deviation the same way. So the expected value would be 9.72 with a standard deviation of 1.39. I'm going to work out a different example here um, with our coin, or I'm sorry, with our dice rolling. So here is our dice rolls. And um, okay, so if this is the probability that we're going to roll a die 10 times, what's the probability we get whatever number, let's say a four? Okay, so we know the probability of rolling a four is one sixth, and we're going to do it 10 times. So combinations, remember in Excel is just combin. So we're going to do 10 trials, and we're going to get however many successes. I'm going to put the dollar sign in here, so it'll do the calculation. Okay, then we're going to look at p to the x. So again, p to the x power. And again, I'm going to put the dollar sign in. Oops, in this case, we need that one. Okay, and I'm going to get rid of some, I'll do that in a second. Then one minus p, and I'm going to put parentheses there, one minus p to one minus p, which is that value, to the power of uh, n minus x. So again, it's a little bit hard to have the uh, parentheses and stuff. But we're going to get that value. And again, I'm going to put the dollar sign in so it stays the same. Okay, so that is exactly doing this formula. Again, it was complicated to do by hand. And then all we do is multiply the three numbers together. Okay, again, the zero case was pretty straightforward. If I did the algebra right and the dollar signs right, it should work out. So I must not have missed anything. Let's make it combin. I did, I put the dollar sign in the wrong place. So still put the dollar sign in the wrong place. Comp in of There we go. And again, you can see that can happen a lot of ways. 10 choose five is 252. P to the X. Um, that number's not right. Oh, it is, because every number 
to the zeroth power is one. Okay, so let's check our dollar signs again. There we go. And again, uh, we get some decimal places. And we'll center it so we look snazzy. Um, 10 minus 10 is zero, so anything to the zeroth power is one. You can see that you know these probabilities start big and then get little. These probabilities start little and get big. Um, but as we multiply them together, we get these very reasonable looking values. Now you can see the probability of rolling a four 10 times in a row is very, very small. Right. But that gives you the thing. If we add these all together, if we did it right, right, they should add up to one because, right, something has to happen. If you roll a die between 10 times, it's going to come up a four somewhere between zero and 10 times. Now, what's cool about doing this in a spreadsheet, and one reason why I think it's a good idea for you to do, is that if we take this and we just make a copy of it, we'll put that over here so we have it later. We can come back here and say, well, now let's recreate this. But instead of thinking about rolling a four on one die, what if we think about rolling an eight on two dice? And if you remember how often that happens, right, that was one sixth. The probability of rolling an eight on two dice is 13.89%. It's 536, right? Remember we did that number. And in fact, we could just put five divided by 36 and let the spreadsheet do the math for us. Well, boom, now we've done the whole problem again. And so if I said, what's the probability that we roll um, a pair of dice 10 times? What's the probability we get an eight however many times? Well, the probability we did it uh, zero times is we get 22%. One is 36% of the time. Two is 26% of the time. We could turn these into percents if we wanted. Notice that it's very unlikely you'd get an eight 10 times in a row, or nine times out of 10 even is very, very small. Now, those of you who were at the lectures last week, Remember that I rolled either a one or a two number of successes. Remember, I rolled the dice on the table. Um, in one of the sections, I rolled it twice, and in one of them, I rolled it once. So I had 10% or 20% on the board. And um, that seems pretty likely that those were pretty good answers to that. Now, if we wanted to calculate the overall average, the mean is equal to. Uh, n times p, well, I got all those numbers up here. So I don't even have to do that calculation n times p. I don't even have to work out the actual probability. But 1.38, which again makes some sense, um, given those probabilities we saw before, and see it's actually the same as this, right? Because that's how uh, the math works. The standard deviation was that little bit harder number, which was square root of NP on minus P, which you might not have even written down because it was just back here on the slide a couple ago. I zipped past it pretty quick. The variance of X is equal to NP minus one minus P. The standard deviation would be the square root of that. So we can take N times P times one minus P and that's the variance. And if we want to find the standard deviation, we just take the square root of that, which is 1.09. So that tells us that rolling 10 times a pair of dice, we would expect to get 1.38 eights with a standard deviation of 1.1. Now we can interpret that the same way as the standard deviation we had before and think about things like, uh, 95% of the time it should happen within two standard deviations and all that kind of stuff if the data follows a normal distribution. So the binomial probability is this very special case of discrete probability. The formula is sort of annoying, right, with the combination P, one minus P, right? That's sort of an annoying calculation to do. Spreadsheets do it really well. <clears throat> and you can calculate the mean and the variance. Um, for this assignment, I'm going to ask that you do 
at least on the homework that asks you to do this, work it out. But even better is there's a command in, Excel, in this uh, called binome dist. And you can just put in, if I want to see what's the probability I get um, two successes from 10 trials with a probability of success 0.139, boom, it gives me the same number that I have over here. Now, breaking it down makes it easy to kind of see how the pieces build together. But that's how um, it works. So chapter six is about discrete random variables. We talk about the more generally first and then about uh, the special case of binomial once we did that. So great.